All right. So the sermon this morning is going to be a little bit different maybe than what we typically hear. And every once in a while I give a sermon where I like to make a, a small disclaimer before we get going. And this is going to be one of those sermons, okay? First of all, I want to welcome you to Word of Truth Baptist Church and give you a little bit of insight into the name Word of Truth. Because here's a, a church where we exalt the truth, where we, we want to know what is true and what's a lie. We want to know what's right. And, and this is a characteristic of our church. I decided this a long time ago that, that I want to know just what's right. I don't want people lying to me and make me try to feel better. I don't, want, I don't want things hidden from me or covered from me or I have to, to slowly get, get allowed into, you know, to, to learn more and more and more you know, about, about what the truth actually is. You know, a lot of the cults out there try to do this and the, you know, the Scientology and all these other weird things where they, they, they reveal a little bit of information. I mean, the occult is the same way. They withhold information. I want it all. I want to know what the truth is, and that's one of the reasons why this church is named Word of Truth Baptist Church, because we care about knowing what is true and what is right. Now, this morning, or today, is September 11th, right, 2016. It's the 15-year anniversary of the tragic events that happened 15 years ago on 9-11, when the, when the planes were crashed into the, the Twin Towers, when more than just two buildings fell that day, when there was actually three buildings, when the Pentagon was hit, when the plane uh, crashed in Pennsylvania. Look, all of these things that happened, you know, everybody's very familiar with a lot of those events. And the title of my sermon this morning is Never Forget. Okay, and that's, and that's the, the, the theme that's being used all throughout, you know, ever since 9-11, it's this, this idea of never forgetting. Now, this sermon is going to be packed with truth. Okay, and this is in honor and in respect of the people that lost their lives, the, the, the 3,000 odd, odd number of people that died on that day. And, um, you know, this is going to be maybe an offensive sermon for some people, but what we care about is the truth. Amen. What we care about is getting to the truth. And, you know, I, I toss and turn about, about preaching certain topics sometimes, not because I'm worried about what people are going to think, but I try to do everything from a biblical perspective. From what the Bible teaches. You know, I'm not here just to preach politics or just to, to go off on various subjects. We're going to have a lot of scripture this morning. And the first point I want to make and, and, and have you understand before we get into anything else is to never forget that there is a battle going on every day. And we saw that in, in Ephesians chapter 6. There is a spiritual battle that is going on that we need to be aware of and we need to be ready for. A lot of the events that happen in this world are just part of a bigger battle that is going on. And when we can see what is really happening, when we can understand the truth and, and really start to put the pieces together, you'll, you'll get to know the importance of the message and the importance of the things and the events that are happening around us instead of just the surface of what they want you to know. Right? Those in charge. Let's look here in Ephesians chapter 6. Because there's a lot of truth to this and there's a lot of biblical truth, like I said, that we need to understand. Look at verse number 10 of Ephesians 6 where we started reading. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We need to be strong as Christians today. We're living in perilous times. We're living in the end times, the last days. When the perilous times, they're coming. And we need to be fully aware and we need to be strong in the Lord. Not just strong, not strong in ourselves, not going out to the gym and getting physically strong, not necessarily even having all the, the prep work and everything else done and your place to hide in the hills. We need to be strong in the Lord. That is the most important thing. We need to be grounded and founded in God's word and in the truth and be unmovable Amen. and being willing to stand up and, and stand for the truth. Look at verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We need to have our armor on. We're going to get to the armor in just a minute, but look at verse number 12. Here's why we need armor. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This isn't a physical fight. This isn't a physical battle. We're not going to go out and just, you know, start boxing with people in the street, right? That's flesh and blood. It says, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
This is as true as a day is long. There is spiritual wickedness in high places. And again, it's become more and more just exposed lately how wicked and corrupt the people who are in charge, the, the world leaders of, of the various governments all over the world, how wicked and, and perverted they are. And, and the people, I mean, even just looking for people running for president, you know, it's like, it, 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 things, it would be insanity. Even just like 60 or 70 years ago for the people who are running now, to ever have been considered like that person you're going to put up to run for president? I mean, it would be a laughing stock. It would be a joke. It would be something that no one would even think in a million years that some of the people that are, that are running right now would ever be a candidate for the highest office of this country because of the, the moral decay that has happened so much in this country that, that now it's just out in the open. Right. And I'm not saying there haven't been wicked rulers in the past. There's always been spiritual wickedness in high places. There's always been evil people that are out to put others in bondage and to, and to you know, achieve whatever for themselves and ultimately be a pawn of Satan. And I preached a sermon about this a few months ago, about the New World Order and the things that are, that are happening and, you know, everybody's got a different idea of who's responsible, whether it's the Jews, whether it's the Catholic Church, whether, it, you know, everyone, everyone's got somewhere to put the blame. And I, and I mentioned that sermon. You know what? They're all complicit, but they're all pawns. Because ultimately, Satan's behind it. Ultimately, it's a plan that's been in place for a long time. And we see the prophecy and we see what's written in God's word of what is actually going to happen. We see the plans for a one-world government. It's not hidden from our eyes. So if someone wants to call you a conspiracy theorist or a kook or whatever because you believe that there's a new world order being set up, we've got the word of God to stand on. And we know that this is true. Amen. Now, we may not know who exactly is all involved and in all the details of it necessarily because a lot of that stuff's trying to be hidden from the public. Because there's spiritual wickedness in high places of people that have authority and power and want you to believe whatever it is that they want you to believe to achieve their ends. But there's a light. They're working in darkness and they want you to be in darkness. But we've got the light. And the light's going to shine and reveal all the things that they do in darkness. But we need to be ready. And we need to be prepared. And we need to never forget these things. Especially as we live our lives day to day and you're being bombarded with propaganda. You're being bombarded with propaganda in the news. You're being bombarded with propaganda just all around you on what certain people want you to believe and want you to think. And these days, especially with the, with the technology that we have and the media that's available and the, the amount of, of information that can be dispersed so rapidly and so quickly and the control that's involved with being able to just affect millions of people in, in, in an instant with a message. We're going we're gonna to get more to that in just a minute. Let's keep reading here because first we're just going to see a little bit more about the armor of God. I'm going to preach a whole lot about it, but this is one of the ways that we can be ready. We need to be strong in the Lord. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, so for this reason, because there's this spiritual wickedness, because there's rulers of the darkness of this world, we need to make sure we've got the whole armor of God. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. So first thing he mentions, the truth. And that's what we're getting at this morning, the truth. That's what we care about as a church, the truth. Having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Doing what's right, righteous living. Hey, keeping yourself free from all of the sin and wickedness of this world so you can be used of God. We need to have that breastplate of righteousness where people can't, can't attack you and bring you down for wickedness that you're involved in and ruin your testimony and, and, and destroy anything that you have to say because you're just living some filthy, wicked life anyways. We need to have that breastplate. It's a defense. The breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Be a soul winner. Have your feet ready to go out and bring the good news and shine that light unto the, unto the dark places of this world. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Faith, yes, for salvation, but I think this isn't even talking about salvation. This is talking about just having faith in God in order to help you stand, in order to defend yourself. When the attacks start coming and you feel real vulnerable, 
when you could rely on your faith in God, say, hey, God's more mighty than anything else than these wicked people have against me. So no matter what's going to come my way, I've got faith that God's going to be able to look over me, that God's going to be able to protect me, that God's going to be able to provide for me. That shield will keep you strong. Amen. He is our buckler. He is our shield. We saw this on Wednesday night. Our strength being derived from the Lord. Important, it says above all. I mean, that, that is the number one defense mechanism that we need against the wickedness and as part of our armor. The shield of faith, wherewith you, be, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Here's our sword right here. This is our truth. This is what we have to fight, to defend, and to attack with is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Here's the Apostle Paul saying, I'm in bonds right now. Bonds, meaning in chains. He's in prison. Because he's preaching the gospel, and he's saying, you know what? Pray for me too, that I could have boldness. As it, you know, you talk about someone who had boldness in their life, someone whose life was, was kind of marked by boldness. You think of the Apostle Paul. You see, he's really, hot, really high on that list. And he's saying, you know what? Pray me. I need more boldness. Because I need to open up my mouth and speak the truth and speak and preach the mystery of the gospel of Christ. We all need that boldness. If the Apostle Paul isn't above that, we all need that. We all need to be praying for ourselves and for others that, that we could have the boldness it takes to withstand. Because what happens when you're in the minority? And if you're saved today, you're in the minority. Disciples asked Jesus if there's many that are saved, and he basically said, no. He said, are there a few? Yes. There are a few people that are saved. You're in the minority. And when you start preaching things that the majority don't believe, guess what? You're going to get a lot more resistance. You get a lot of people, you know, I mean, it's religion already in our society is taboo, right? It's not something you're supposed to talk about. You're supposed to just talk about the weather. You're supposed to just talk about sports. You're supposed to just talk about all these things that don't matter at all in people's lives. So you could just go along and get along and, and everyone could just die and go to hell. I mean, that's what the world would have you to think. That's what the world's going to teach you to do. That's why you need boldness to be able to counteract that culture, to counteract that stigma of being able to bring up the Lord Jesus Christ. We need boldness today. Never forget, never forget that there are evil forces at work every day. Forces of darkness that are fighting against the light. This is going on around us and you can't always see it. There's a spiritual battle going on. And we need to be spiritually strong. There's a new world order being established. There's an antichrist that's going to come to power and rule the world. We see that from scripture. There's a beast and a false prophet that are going to complete the unholy trinity. These things are coming to pass. They are, the, the events are happening and they're moving to establish this event that we read about in the Gospels, in Revelation, in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, you know, in all these various places throughout the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament, these prophecies that are going to come to pass. And they're going to speak great blasphemies, and there's going to be war made against the saints. And there's going to be people martyred for Christ, and the persecution is going to come. And we don't know 100% for sure when exactly that's coming, but it's very likely that it could happen in our lifetime, and we need to make sure that we're ready. You can't just put it off and say, oh, I don't know. People all throughout history have always needed to be ready. We need to be ready to make sure that we're able to stand. And I think now more than ever, we could see the signs of it really coming to pass. Turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because there's also people that will try to deceive you. We need to never forget that there are people out there trying to deceive you. on the end times. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 
2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Never forget that there's people that want to deceive you about when things are going to happen. There's a lot of people that teach that Jesus Christ can come back at any moment. That's not true. There's a lot of people that are going to teach you that, oh, you don't have to worry about what's going to happen in all the hard times, all the persecution, and everything else is going to happen because we're just going to be raptured up out of here before any of that bad stuff happens. There's people that are going to deceive you and try to tell you that, yeah, I mean today, maybe even, maybe even during the service, Jesus Christ will just come back and... We'll all be gone. That's a lie. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This clearly states out exactly what needs to happen and tells us not to be deceived. Look at verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. What's that talking about? The rapture. The coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back and our gathering together unto him when we get brought up to him when he comes in the clouds. Verse number two. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. He said, don't let anyone fool you. Don't, don't be moved. Don't be worried as that the day is at hand like it's right now. Why? Verse number three, let no man deceive you by any means. Don't let anyone trick you. Don't be deceived. For that day shall not come except. So that day is not going to come except unless this happens first. Except there come a falling away first. We could see a falling away happening around us. And that's, but see, that's not it. You could say, oh, well, there's a, yeah, there's a falling away. So it could happen, right? And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Has the son of perdition been revealed? Is it out in the open who the Antichrist is? Is it just public knowledge? Yes, here's a guy who's standing in the temple of God, claiming to be God and showing himself and, and, and speaking all manner of blasphemy against God. Has that been revealed yet? Because I don't think it has. I haven't seen it. Verse number four, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. The only people who are doing something like this are those, you know, the, there's, a, there's a few charlatans out in, you know, in weird foreign countries that have small followings after them. They claim to be God. They claim to be Jesus Christ. But that's been going on for a long time. There have been antichrists. There have been, you know, these false prophets that get their small cult gatherings and they go off into some little commune somewhere and, and, and drink the Kool-Aid and die. You know, I mean, and, that, and that's been happening for a long time. This is on a much bigger scale. This is going to be much more massive and deceive a lot more people than what those, those few antichrists have been doing throughout time. It says he's going to oppose and exalt himself, in verse 4, above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Look, this hasn't happened yet. The temple of God hasn't even been rebuilt, but when the, temple of, when the temple is rebuilt, there's going to be a man that's going to stand in there and proclaim himself to be God incarnate. How else do you read this? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 4. That's what it says. And it says, don't let anyone trick you. These things have to happen first. And then Jesus Christ is going to come. Verse number 5, remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. He said, I've already told you this stuff. When I was there with you, I already told you what's going to happen. <laughs> Brother Robert, will you go get my laptop for me, please? We need to not forget the prophecy that God has already revealed to us. Never forget what is revealed in Scripture when it comes to the end times, when it comes to the plans and the things, that, the events that we're going to see happen. When you understand the bigger battle, when you understand that there are forces involved in this world that are playing into something bigger than what you see on the surface, thank you, sir, than what you see on the surface of the events happening around the world, it's easier to see past what you are told that you are supposed to believe and to start to see the truth. There are events that happen, like, like I said, um, world events, major events, you know, terrorist events that are happening throughout the world. And there's a surface truth or a surface story that is being pushed out there. And people want you to believe, oh yeah, yeah, this is just this, this is just that. 
But there's a bigger truth to all of that. There's a deeper truth. And it's definitely involved in the prophecy, in the scripture, and in what's happening in the spiritual battle. Now, most people are deceived into thinking that most people are just like them. And it's very, very difficult. And I, and I brought this up time and time again, and I'm going to keep bringing it up time and time again because you need to be warned. We need to be aware that there, and I'm not some paranoid person that just thinks everybody's after him, okay? But by the, by the word of God, there are people out there that are out to do harm, that are out to do bad, that are wicked people down to their soul, that are children of the devil, that are out to seek and to destroy. And you know, we're to seek and to save that which is lost. There's people out there to do the exact opposite. Right. There are people out there that want souls to get sent to hell. There are people out there that are devising and planning and scheming to do wickedness unto other people that are just wicked in their hearts. Now, I believe that everybody sitting in this room this morning is not like that at all. And it's hard to even comprehend that a person can be like that. Because you've never had thoughts like that. You just think, you know, even though you sin and you might have done wrong to people in the past, you're not this cold-hearted person that's just looking to destroy other people. Right. It's hard to even imagine and comprehend that people like that exist, but they do. They exist, and not only do they exist, they exist in high places. They exist in very powerful places. These are people that have been given over themselves unto their pride, given themselves over unto lasciviousness and unto cleanness and unto every manner of evil. There are reprobate people out there that are given over unto all unrighteousness, all uncleanness, everything that's wicked. And they exist in the high places. A lot of people think that, oh, the politicians that you're electing, that, that you're just like me. They're just, you know, they're, but they're more successful and there's someone to be looked up to. They're generally good people that really want what's best for everyone. Don't be deceived by that. Don't be deceived by that. People who, who are making a point and spending thousands and millions of dollars to get an office of control and power, there's a reason for that. I mean, when someone's willing to spend millions of their own, I mean, think about millions of dollars. I don't even know what millions of dollars is like. I have no concept of what that would be like to even possess millions of dollars. And to them, they're just being willing to, to, to throw it into a campaign. For what? Do you think it's because they love you that much? Do you think it's because they care? Do you think someone like Donald Trump, who has this great empire, right, who has all of this money, is just so kind-hearted? I mean, he's been working all of his life. He's been making shady deals with politicians. He's been doing all the stuff he's been doing because of the love of money, which is the root of all evil, but he cares about you. And he's willing now to just be a philanthropist and donate all of this money and resources into this this office of the presidency because he cares about you. If you believe that, you're a fool. He doesn't care about you. There's a lot of things that come along with that position of power. And that's what he cares about. You can look at the career politicians. You look at the people that have made their living, that have gone in to, to offices and have stayed there for decades and made their whole career out of being a politician and have left millionaires because of the corruption because of the, the perks and the benefits and the, the greased elbows and everything else that goes along with, with this corrupt system that we're a part of. Never forget, never forget that the psychopath killers, the John Wayne Gacy's, the Jeffrey Dahmer's, right? The people that have done the atrocious things, the horrible, unspeakable, unthinkable things that you would never in a million years ever have those thoughts even come into your mind that they actually did and, and, and acted out. That their neighbors knew nothing about it for long periods of time and were even shocked when the, news, when the, when the information came to light. Right. Why? Because they fit in. Because they appeared on the outside like normal. But on the inside, they are ravening wolves. They are the wolves in sheep's clothing. They are the people that want to make you think they're just like everyone else. Eh, maybe a little quirky. Oh, maybe a little bit different. But they're real friendly. They're real nice. They're someone you can trust. John Wayne Gacy was a clown, right? I mean, the people trusting him with their kids. 
with their kids. And that's some sad news. And you know what? You think those people don't exist in other, in other areas? They're called psychopaths. Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. They don't feel bad. They don't feel remorse. They don't feel guilt. They don't, they don't have a problem doing any of those things. It doesn't matter to them. And these people exist in high places. Now, I'm not going to point out a specific person here or there or there. You know, there may be one or two people, one or two, you know, in our entire federal government system that, that are, you know, that, that, are, that are okay people that, that are actually trying to do something good. Like, I'm not going to just go down the list. But by and large, we got to be aware of this. And you know what? The problem that we have, it's not, uh, it's not going to be solved politically. The battle is not a political battle. Amen. The battle is a spiritual battle. The battle is between good and evil. The battle is between light and darkness. And if we're going to affect any type of a change in this dark world, it's going to be spreading light. It's going to be spreading truth. It's going to be spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's where the true power is at. And that's where any type of real change is going to happen. It doesn't happen through politicians. I mean, we just had one in office for eight years who ran on the platform of change, right? Things are so bad and we're going to change it and it's going to be great. And it's been more of the same. Why? Because he's just a puppet anyways. Now, we never want to forget. And all my zeal of never forgetting, I forgot to print out what I wanted to print. That's why I have my laptop here for me. <laughs> But let's never forget that false flags have been used by governments throughout history to, to gain political support for wars when a people do not want to get involved in a war because most normal people don't want to go to war. You don't want to fight. You don't want to send your children off to go and shoot people and get shot at and die and, kill, you know, and have all this bloodshed. People don't want that for good reason. But the spiritual wickedness and the rulers of the darkness of this world, they don't care about the people dying at all. They probably like that they're dying. And what they care about is their money. They care about their government contracts. They care about making money and making merchandise off of you. That's what they care about. And they'll do anything to accomplish that. But in order to do that, they know that they need to have a propaganda campaign set up in order to deceive you, in order to get you on board to volunteer. Say, hey, instead of forcing people to go fight, let's just get them to want to go and fight. How are we going to do that? I've got an idea. Because people innately understand that fighting a defensive battle is justified. When you've been attacked, when you need to be protected because there's aggressors coming after you and you just stand up and fight for yourself and defend yourself, that's right. That's moral. That is morally acceptable. But to go out and aggress and try to take over other countries, that's reprehensible. When you just go and just try to dominate and create a world kingdom. But the people in power and the people that, that are, again, the spiritual wickedness in high places, that's what they want. So they need to sell it in a way to where you don't know that, that that's what they're actually doing. Right. So they create these false flag events. And, and you know, the, the name false flag came from when there was you know, naval battles going on and there was a ship. And what they would do is they would raise up the wrong flag. Right? So let's just say like, um, you know, the, the British is at war with, with America, as, as happened you know, in, the, in the, the Revolutionary War. Right? And an American ship was to go out and they see the, the British ship out there and they would raise the British flag to make them think, oh, that's not the enemy, right? And then they'd get in real close and then just start attacking them and, and, and you know, ambush them and destroy them because they were deceived into thinking, oh, this is, you know, someone on our side. It is a false flag. And that's actually against the, you know, the, the, the international rules of war. It's something that's, that's despicable and reprehensible. You know, it's not a, a real fight. But whatever, I'm not even going to get into all that. That's where the name came from. But it's been used a lot more in our modern times where, again, with the, with the flow of information and being able to, to affect people by saying, hey, you know, where, where someone actually carries out an attack or a seeming attack on themselves, and then blames it on someone else. So they'll dress up a certain way, they'll wear whatever, you know, they'll raise their flag. 
as if it's coming from a different country in order to make the world think, in order to make that population think, wow, we've just been attacked by whoever they want to pin the blame on. Whoever the interest is, wherever they want to go in order to invade and to attack and make a war with and, and steal you know, their, their resources or what, whatever, the, whatever the motivation is. That's what they did. And I have a list, actually, just so that you can be aware of this. I don't have everything committed to memory, which is why I made this list. And um, I did a little research on it, so I don't want to just leave it out of the sermon. And it's important to understand that these things historically have happened, and it's verified, and it's true, and you can look this up for yourself just as much as anybody else. And I'm going to read some of these for you. Um, and, and, I, and I got this from, from other websites, but these things I've researched, and I know that they're true, and they're in the public domain. And you can look it up for yourself. The Gleiwitz incident says, a major with the Nazi SS admitted at the Nuremberg trials that under orders from the chief of the Gestapo, he and some other Nazi operatives faked attacks on their own people and resources, which they blamed on the Poles. They blamed it on Poland. If you remember when Germany, they, the, with World War II, it started with the, with the advance against Poland, right? And they blamed it on Poles to justify the invasion of Poland. See, they really wanted to take over Poland. That was an asset that they wanted to have. They wanted to have control over that country. But they needed a reason to do it. Because the people of Germany wouldn't have just said, hey, let's, we like Poland, let's just go and take them over. Because they say, no, that's wrong, that's wicked, we can't do that. But when it looks like they've been invaded, when it looks like, oh, hey, look, the Polish army came in and they did this to us, well, we're not going to let them do that. We're going to go and show them and we're going to beat them. And you get the whole, the whole country on your side then. It says, Nazi General Franz Halder also testified at the Nuremberg trials that Nazi leader Hermann Goering admitted to setting fire to the German parliament building in 1933 and then falsely blaming the communists for the arson. That was one way for them to justify to the people getting to, going to war. The Levant Affair. Israel admitted that an Israeli terrorist cell operating in Egypt planted bombs in several buildings, including U.S. diplomatic facilities, then left behind evidence implicating the Arabs as the culprits. One of the bombs detonated prematurely, allowing the Egyptians to identify the bombers, and several of the Israelis later confessed. See, their plan got screwed up, which is how they got caught. They were leaving evidence. They were trying to make it look like, oh, these people did it, right? as they blew up this building. But their plan didn't go as, as it was supposed to. They got caught, they were identified, and then they later confessed that it actually happened. Operation Ajax. The CIA admits that it hired Iranians in the 1950s to pose as communists and stage bombings in Iran in order to turn the country against its democratically elected prime minister. This is our own government. That's the CIA of the, of the United States going into another country and disrupting the politics in that country by making these false flag events. The USS Liberty cover-up, this, this is a really big one. The Liberty incident was an attack on a United States Navy technical research ship. And I saw an entire documentary about this. This is, this is pretty, um, this will make your blood boil. It says the USS Liberty, it was a technical research ship that was attacked by Israeli Air Force jet fighter aircraft and Israeli Navy motor torpedo boats on June 8, 1967 during the Six-Day War. A combined air and sea attack killed 34 crew members and wounded 171 crew members. The Liberty was a surveillance ship which was monitoring the ongoing activity and was attacked in international waters. Israel came in and attacked and, and just a total false flag. They came in, they saw the flags raised as the United States, and Israel and the United States were allies. They came in and just bombed the heck out of that battleship and destroyed their communications right off the bat, not to be able to, to make any SOS or any type of communications outside to get help. And where they screwed up is they didn't sink the ship because people still survived. They were, they were scrambling. And, you know, go ahead and look this up. There are people, and you know what? The, the, the U.S. Navy members were sworn, to, they, they were not supposed to talk about this event at all to anybody. And just recently, some of the people that were on that ship have opened up their mouths and started saying, started talking about it and saying, you know what? This is what really happened. 
They were bought off. They were told. They were warned. They were threatened. You don't talk about this. It was covered up. Our own allies. And, but the purpose was to get the U.S. involved and be said it, was, oh, it wasn't Israel that did it. It was someone else that did it. Operation Gladio. You can look these up later. I'm not going to read through all of them. I actually have a few here, but Operation Northwoods in 1962, the American Joint Chiefs of Staff signed off on a plan to blow up American airplanes. The American Joint Chiefs of Staff, get this, the American Joint Chiefs of Staff signed off on a plan to blow up American airplanes. America blowing up their own airplanes using an elaborate plan involving the switching of airplanes and also to commit terrorist attacks on American soil and then to blame it on the Cubans in order to justify an invasion of Cuba. Now that didn't actually happen, but that was, that was a plan that was signed off on to put into place and to implement in order, you know, from the U.S. government. Within the United States, you know, yeah, the, the moral, mighty United States who stands on truth and, and, and righteousness and liberty, right, would never do anything like that. Gulf of Tonkin incident. How, how we got involved in the Vietnam War. The NSA admits that it lied about what really happened in the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964, manipulating data to make it look like North Vietnamese boats fired on a U.S. ship so as to create a false justification for the Vietnam War. And how did that Vietnam War turn out for us? Oh, that was great, right? All those souls lost. All those people died. For, for a fake event. Being conned into thinking, we need to go fight the communists because they attacked us. And it's just a big lie. Yeah. A lot of people got involved in the Afghanistan and Iraq wars recently and have gone and fought and died. And you know what it was for? A big, fat lie. We're told to believe that these terrorists came and hijacked the planes with box cutters and flew them into these buildings with, with the capability of, of, you know, that most very, very skilled professional pilots would said that they would not be able to perform themselves let alone these people who failed at flight school, as we're told. You know, and, and what's interesting is we have, supposedly there's a big ball of flame when, the, you know, we, still, we saw it, not supposedly, there was a big ball of flame, right, when the, when the plane smashed into the tower. That was recorded. We could see that. And that damage caused enough damage, supposedly, for the, the, to cause the, the Twin Towers to fall, yet they were able to find the passports of the terrorists, in the rubble. I mean, it was burning so hot to, to melt steel, right? The jet fuel, which never burns hot enough to melt steel, somehow in this instance was able to melt the steel. And yet, oh wow, we're walking around. Hey, look, here's a passport. I bet this was on that airplane. They found that stuff right away. There are people, there are remains, there's all kinds of debris that they have, that took months to clear up, you know, all, to, to get to the bottom of all that stuff. But how quickly they were able to find those passports and find out exactly who was, inv who was involved, right? No, my friends, it was a false flag. And that's the truth of the matter. And like I said, people might get upset about that, but... It's, there's, there's way too much evidence out there to show the country. Now, am I saying I know exactly all the details of what happened? No, I don't. But what I do know is that we've been lied to. Yeah. Like in so many other events throughout history, we've been lied to, again, to, to prop up a false war, to prop up a war in Iraq. We had nothing to do with it from the beginning. Why in the world did we invade Iraq? The 9-11 the, the Commission report, the report that come out now has finally been you know, unredacted. A lot of the areas that were crossed off that the public was never able to see. Now it's showing like Saudi Arabia is being behind it. What does that have to do with Iraq? Why did we go to war with Iraq over, over 
the towers come down. And, and oh, and by the way, everybody says you'll never forget, and you see the two towers. There was a third tower that fell. Right. It was a Solomon building. It's called Building Seven. And you, you know, I'm not going to go into all. Look it up for yourself. The information's rampant out. There's so much evidence to show you that we've been lied to. But when you look at the video footage of that building coming down and everyone was evacuated and it comes down exactly like every other single controlled demolition recording that you can see. Oh, but it came down because of fires. Yeah, right. In its own footprint. Not buying it, my friends. Never forget about the false flags throughout history. Use history as you go. It's happened for, de for years, for forever. It's probably happened forever. A justification for people to go to war. 9-11 is no different. Don't be so naive as to fall into the trap of, you know, this patriotism and nationalism of, of going off, you know, putting your faith in a man or even worse, putting your faith in a politician to save you and to protect you. And I've got the answers. We just need to go and fight these people over there in the desert because they brought down our Twin Towers. No, they didn't. The enemy is at home. The enemy is domestic. And I'm not saying that those people are good or righteous or anything like that. And you know what? I've heard people say, you know, maybe God did use, you know, some of these things to bring some judgment upon some wicked nations. I don't know. But that doesn't mean that we're righteous. God has used wicked nations to judge other wicked nations plenty of time throughout the Bible. Right. And that does not make it right or justified for us. Okay? But the answer is not in politics. Don't buy into the propaganda that those who are really in charge want you to believe that you're in danger of terrorists like ISIS. You know, you need to give up your liberty and you give up all your freedoms just for us to protect you. It's just, it's just a plan. It's just part of the agenda. It's part, it's part of bringing you into control, bringing you into subjection, bringing you into bondage so that you're not able to fight. I mean, all throughout history, that's what they've, they've done is, is to try to subdue the people and to get you. It's easier for them than having to force you into submission to get you to willingly give up your freedoms. Just give it up. Well, who needs those guns anyways? What do you need it for? I need it to defend myself against a tyrannical government. That's what I need it for. Amen. What do you need an AR for? What do you need an assault rifle for? What do you, what do you need these guns for? You, have, you, have, you already have a hunting rifle. Yeah, I know. And I use that for hunting. And I train and practice with my AR and with my other weapons so that I'm ready in case I need to defend myself against a larger force than someone just breaking into my house. I got a shotgun for that. Now, I also like target shooting. That's also a lot of fun. But, you know, what do you need it for? I don't want to be taken over. I don't, I don't want to be held hostage by my own government. Amen. The enemy's powerful. But see, that's a physical fight. I'm not even that concerned with the physical fight. I'm really not. I actually do like the shooting more than, <laughs> more than worrying about having to, to defend myself against, you know, against the government knocking down my door. Because ultimately that, that is just a physical fight. You know what? I'm going to try to walk in the way that, that God has laid out for me. And whether that be a physical fight or not. And we're going to get into a little bit of the physical fighting stuff tonight in the sermon tonight if you want to if you if you come back for that. Because we see, like David said, you know, God has taught his hands to war. We see men of God doing things like physically and defending themselves or bringing righteousness, you know, like even going as far as killing people. And it's all acceptable by God. And it was actually good in those situations. And, and again, I'm going to go into all that tonight. But, by, you know, but we're still not called to some physical battle. right? It's, that's not the, the battle we have. It's a spiritual battle. And um, again, I'm not just calling for taking up arms. I'm saying we need to not forget. We need to be aware of what's going on around us. We need to see the truth behind the lies. We need to not just accept what the world is trying to tell us on any front, in any matter, and use discernment 
and when you have the bigger picture from the scripture, you can start to see how these things play into place. You're going to be a lot more wise um, about what's going on. The enemy is powerful. Look at all that has been done already in this, you know, now it's called a post 9-11 world, right? Why is it called a post 9-11 world? Because of how much has changed from before that to after that and has changed in our daily living, in our day-to-day -day life, in, in the regular business, in the commerce, in the travel, in everything that we do now, there's new laws, there's new restrictions, there's new limitations on our freedom as a result of what happened on that day. And you know what? It was all planned in advance. The Patriot Act was written before the events even happened. It was just sitting, waiting for the right event to come along, to push through and say, we need to do this. And it's for your own good. You need to give up your freedom so we can protect you. It's terrorism. The terrorism didn't come from the, the people that they said it came from. Turn if you would, where are you? If you uh, you're in 2 Thessalonians, turn if you would, Ephesians 2. <clears throat> Satan's powerful. And his spirit actually works with men. We need to never forget who we're fighting. We never forget there's a battle going on, there's a spiritual battle, but ne never forget who we're fighting against. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world. Look at this. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. It's talking about the prince of the power of the air. It's talking about Satan. And that spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He's at work. He's at work with people and, and their, their wickedness and, and getting things to be done that he can't do just all by himself. So he's using other people to bring about his master plan because he wants to be God. He wants to stand in the place of God. He wants the worship. He wants people to fall down and worship him just like he wanted Jesus Christ to do. That's his ultimate plan. He wants to know what it's like to be God. Turn if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And he's working right now. That's why I showed you that verse in Ephesians. Because he's working right now. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It's active. It's going on. It's happening. Day by day, it's happening. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Because we need to never forget who the God of this world is. There's a lot of people who teach on the sovereignty of God. You know, implying that you know, God's all-powerful. Well, we know God's all-powerful. Right? But when people use that phrase and they throw that phrase around, basically what they're telling you is that God is in control of everything that's happening on this earth. And that's just false and wicked. Right. Because they're saying that the things that happen that are wicked in this world, that like God is somehow responsible for that. That God is making those things happen. And that is not true. God is not just a puppet master pulling the strings of everybody on this earth. He's given us a free will. Those strings are cut. We can do whatever we want. He may lead us. He may guide us. He may step in here or there to make sure things happen. But he is not just completely in control of everything that happens. Not that he doesn't have the power to be capable of doing such, but he doesn't do those things. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the, conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom... In them that are lost, meaning in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, 
who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, God is the one who wanted the light to shine out of darkness. God's the one that commanded it to happen. But you know what? The God of this world, the devil, Satan, the God of this world, not the Lord, not Jehovah, not Jesus Christ, but the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. He's the one that's looking for people not to be saved. He's the one that's tricking and deceiving people. Satan is a, is a liar and the father of it. Amen. That's what Jesus said. He's a deceiver. And he's out trying to deceive people. Never forget who the God of this world is. <clears throat> Turn if you want to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Just go, go a couple chapters to the left. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We need to never forget the devices that Satan uses to get an advantage over us. We need to be aware that the battle is going on and we need to be aware of what is being used, the deceitfulness, the tactics that are being used against us. Verse number 10, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Verse number 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, his device is plural, but the one he's talking about specifically here, he's talking about forgiving other people. Why? So that you can be reconciled, so that you're not divided. Satan wants us to be divided and fighting against ourselves instead of fighting against him. In the local church, we need to be unified. We can't just be a bunch of people who are divided and have all these problems with each other. We're not going to get anything done for Christ that way. Right. It's not going to happen. But you know what? Being aware of that, that Satan, he wants that to happen. He wants people to have problems with each other. He wants there to be murmurers. He wants there to be backbiters. He wants people fighting against each other because we're going to be distracted then and not doing what God has for us to do. That's what he wants. And when we are aware of that and we never forget the devices that Satan's going to have against us, we're going to be much more powerful to be able to respond and be able to recognize, identify, and say, you know what? I see the truth behind this. This isn't really, you know, this is Satan trying to attack us. This is, this is, this is what's really happening. And be able to step back and deal with the situation appropriately instead of getting caught up in emotion or getting caught up in, 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 in the fight and being divided against each other. Amen. Last place I'll have you turn. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Pastor Burzens, I can't believe you believe in conspiracy theories. I can't believe that you believe 9-11 was an inside job. I can't believe that. I can't believe you don't. It's been 15 years and the evidence is, is astounding. But yes, I believe in conspiracies and I don't care if the media has made that into a bad term and to make you sound like a kook or an idiot. Conspiracies have always happened. People conspire to do evil things. Right. The official story is a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy that Al-Qaeda came and hijacked the planes. That was their conspiracy. I just say that's the wrong conspiracy. It didn't originate with them. It originated from within inside. What's the difference? They're both conspiracy theories. Oh, the difference is that the one that I believe has a lot more evidence to support it than the one that we've been told. But look at Acts chapter 20. Again, you can say, oh, you're just paranoid. You think everyone's out to get you? No, look. We've been warned. There's a difference. Verse number 28, Acts chapter 20. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Take heed. Listen, pay attention, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He says, as soon as I'm gone, it's going to happen. This isn't being paranoid. It's a warning. It's saying, look, this is going to happen. There's going to be wolves that are going to come in and try to devour and destroy you. Also of your own selves shall men arise, even people from within shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Why? Divide the church. Split up the work, right? We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. 
People are going to rise up and try to draw people after them, draw people away, and then, and then ruin the, uh, the, the effectiveness of the church to really fight against the real enemies. And the enemies are going to come in with their own little false flags and try to infiltrate and get in among us to destroy the work that's going on. It's going to happen. We, need to be, we are warned about it. We need to never forget these things and be aware of it. Be on guard. Be vigilant. Be sober because your adversary, the devil, you know, walking about as a lion, um, as a roaring lion, seeking who he may, who he may devour. Sorry, my, my, my brain froze again. That's what he's doing. We need to be vigilant. He's out there looking to devour. Verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Say, Pastor Burns, you already told us about this. I'm warning. I'm going to warn and warn and warn because I love you. I love this church. I love God. And I want to make a big impact in the spiritual battle that's going on today. Our memory verse, we're, we're warned of the same type of people in Jude. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We need to contend for that faith. That's a fight. There's a battle. We're contending. Why? For there are certain men crept in unawares. There are people that have subtly crept in unawares, no one knew about it, these people got in, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to come in, and I'm not saying they're here right now. I mean, we have a very small church. But if they're not, I'm not saying they're not, but I mean, if they're not, they're going to come. They're going to creep in unawares. And the, see, the attitude that we have to have, especially when it comes to this, because I don't want everyone just looking at everyone else and thinking like, are you the Judas? Is it you? Right? Jesus Christ knew who Judas was. He was allowed to be there. Now, we need to be aware of what's going on. We need to be aware. And, you know, and if these people get spotted, they're going to be outed and sent away. Okay? They're going to they're be kicked out of this church. But we don't need to just be you know, having a mindset of, of like accusatory towards people. But just always remember, you know, pay attention. When someone starts whispering, someone starts, you know, that doesn't mean that they're an infiltrator. They might just be in sin, right? But keep on guard for yourself and for the flock and be able to, to, to pay attention and spot these signs so that because we are warned that these things are going to happen. They're going to be among us when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. They're, they're, they're not going to have any fear about being among us. They're not going to care at all because they're wicked in the heart because they're wolves looking to just devour. The wolf doesn't care about his prey at all. <laughs> Why would he? He's looking for a meal. And the wolves that try to sneak into churches, they don't care about the prey either. There's many warnings in the Bible of false prophets, of the spiritual battle and of events to come. Let's make sure that we're ready. Let's put on the whole armor of God. Don't believe what you're being told on the tell lie vision. Don't believe it because that is just a bunch of lies. Now, there's always every good lie is going to have some truth mixed in with it. But what it is is a propaganda machine trying to get you to believe a certain way. And that's what it is. I mean, it's... That's the bottom line. When you look at even who owns the major media corporations, there's only like a couple of companies, like two or three own all. You think you have all this great diversity of, of, of news outlets and stuff. And I'm talking about like the national media, right? The, the big, you know, the, these corporates, the ABCs, NBCs, CBS, you know, you think that they're all different. Nope. You go to the top, they all have the same parent companies, except for like maybe a couple of differences. Very, 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 very few. The, the power of the media is astounding. And except for, if it weren't for like the internet now and people being able to share information that's not part of that system and be able to try to actually spread the truth, 
we'd be in a lot of darkness as far as it comes to just having the information available. So it's a two-edged sword. It works both ways for, for you know, the spiritual wickedness, but also for us. So, um, you know, we need to, to use our discernment and ultimately our view from the Bible to help us understand what's real and what's not and what's true and what's not. Getting the knowledge and wisdom from this book will help you to understand, one, the wicked people out there, the wicked heart and the wicked devices. And two, just the righteousness and what we need to be doing to combat that and, and, and where our role is. The only real truth that we have and that we can trust in is the Word of God. Amen. Being knowledgeable with that will do you much better than being knowledgeable in what the propaganda artists want you to think. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would please help us to never forget all that we learn. That help us to never forget um, the, the atrocities that have been performed by the governments, dear Lord. Help us never to forget that we are in a spiritual battle. Help us never to forget who we're actually fighting. Help us never to forget and get distracted into other fights and, and think that we can solve things politically, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to serve you to reach the most people possible, dear God. That's why our soul winning times are so important because we're actually literally going out and trying to reach individuals. We're not going to reach people on a massive scale like through the television. What we're going to do is we're going to reach people individually and try to get through to their hearts and to their minds with your word, with the truth from your word, dear God, and with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would please help us in this endeavor. Endeavor, If we're going to have any type of real change in our society, dear Lord, it's only going to come through people getting converted and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God, equip us and help us to not be deceived, to not have our church split, but that we could continue in full force serving you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.